Chapter Three, Part Two of the Boy Scout Aviators by George Durston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kangaroo. Picked for Service, Part Two. Grenfell had gone, and the troop was now in charge of a new scoutmaster, Francis Wharton. Mr. Wharton was a somewhat older man. At first sight, he didn't look at all like the man to lead a group of scouts, but that, as it turned out, was due to physical infirmities. One foot had been amputated at the time of the Boer War, in which he had served with Grenfell. As a result, he was incapacitated from active service, although, as the scouts soon learned, he had begged to be allowed to go in spite of it. He appeared at the scout headquarters, the pavilion of a small local cricket club, on Wednesday morning. I don't know much about this, more shame to me, he said cheerfully, standing up to address the boys, but I think we can make a go of it. Think we'll be able to do something for the Empire boys. My old friend John Grenfell told me a little. He said you'd pull me through. These are war times, and you'll have to do for me what many a company in the army does for a young officer. They gave him a hearty cheer that was a promise in itself. I can tell you I felt pretty bad when I found they wouldn't let me go to the front, he went on. It seemed hard to have to sit back and read the newspapers when I knew I ought to be doing some of the work. But then Grenfell told me about you boys and what you meant to do, and I felt better. I saw there was a chance for me to help after all. So here I am. These are times when ordinary routine doesn't matter so much. You can understand that. Grenfell put the troop at the disposal of the commander at Ealing, and his first request was that I should send two scouts to him at once. Franklin, I believe you are the senior patrol leader. Yes? Then I shall appoint you assistant scoutmaster, as Mr. Green has not returned from his holiday in France. Will you suggest the names of two scouts for this service? Franklin immediately went up to the new scoutmaster, and they spoke together quietly while a buzz of excited talk rose among the scouts. Who would be honored by the first chance? Every scout there wanted to hear his name called. I think they'll take me for one, said Ernest Graves. He was one of the patrol to which both Harry Fleming and Dick Mercer belonged, and the biggest and oldest scout of the troop, except for Leslie Franklin. He had felt for some time that he should be a patrol leader. Although he excelled in games and was unquestionably a splendid scout, Graves was not popular, for some reason, among his fellows. He was not exactly unpopular either, but there was a little resentment at his habit of pushing himself forward. I don't see why you should go more than anyone else, Graves, said young Mercer. I think they'd take the ones who are quickest. We're probably wanted for messenger work. While I'm the oldest, I ought to have the first chance, said Graves. But the discussion was ended abruptly. Fleming, Mercer, called Mr. Wharton. They stepped forward, their hands in the scout salute, awaiting the scoutmaster's orders. You will proceed at once by rail to Ealing. There you will report at the barracks, handing this note to the officer of the guard. He will then conduct you to the adjutant, or the officer in command, from whom you will take your orders. Yes, sir, said both scouts. Their eyes were afire with enthusiasm, but as they passed toward the door, Dick Mercer's quick ears caught a sullen murmur from Graves. He's making a fine start, he heard him say to Fatty Wells, who was a great admirer of his. Picking out an American? Why, we're not even sure that he'll be loyal. Did you ever hear of such a thing? You shut up, cried Dick fiercely, turning on Graves. He's as loyal as anyone else. We know as much about him as we do about you, anyhow, or more. You may be big, but when we get back... 
I'll make you take that back or fight. Come on, said Harry, pulling Dick along with him. You mustn't start quarreling now. It's time for all of us to stand together, Dick. I don't care what he says anyhow. He managed to get his fiery chum outside, and they hurried along at the scout pace, running and walking alternately toward the West Kensington station of the Underground Railway. They were in their khaki scout uniforms, and several people turned to smile admirably at them. The newspapers had already announced that the Boy Scouts had turned out unanimously to do whatever service they could, and it was a time when women, and it was mostly women who were in the streets, were disposed to display their admiration of those who were working for their country very freely. They had little to say to one another as they hurried along. Their pace was such as to make it wise for them to save their breath, but when they reached the station, they found they had some minutes to wait for a train, and they sat down on the platform to get their breath. They had already one proof of the difference that made by a state of war. Harry stopped at the ticket window. Two, third class for Ealing, he said, putting out the money. But the agent only smiled, having seen their uniforms. On the public service, he questioned. Yes, said Harry, rather proudly. Then you don't need tickets, said the agent. Got my orders this morning. No one in uniform has to pay. Go right through, and ride first class if you like. You'll find plenty of officers riding that way. That's fine. It makes us seem as if we were really of some use, doesn't it, Harry? Yes, answered Harry, but Dick, I've been thinking of what you said to Graves. What did you mean when you told him you knew more about me than you did about him? Hasn't he lived here a long time? No, and there's little mystery about him. Don't you know it? Never heard of such a thing, Dick. You see, I haven't been here so very long, and he was in the patrol when I joined. Oh, yes, so he was. Well, I'll tell you then. You know he's studying to be an engineer at the Polytechnic, and he lives at a boarding house all by himself. Not a regular boarding house, exactly. He boards with Mrs. Johnson, you know. Her husband died a year or two ago, and didn't leave her very much money. He hasn't any father or mother, but he always seems to have plenty of money. And he can play all sorts of games, but he won't do them up right. He says he doesn't care anything about cricket. How old is he? Sixteen, but he's awfully big and strong. He certainly is. He looks older than that to me. Have you ever noticed anything funny about the way he talks? No. Why? Have you? I'm not sure, but sometimes it seems to me he talks more like the people do in a book than you and I do. I wonder why he doesn't like me, pondered Harry. Oh, he likes you as well as he does anyone, Harry. He didn't mean anything. I fancy, when he said about your being chosen just now, he was squiffed because Mr. Warden didn't take him, that's all. He thinks he ought to be ahead of everyone. Well, I didn't ask to be chosen. I'm glad I was, of course, but I didn't expect to be. I think perhaps Leslie Franklin asked Mr. Warden to take me. Of course he did. Why shouldn't he? Just then the coming of the train cut them short. From almost every window, men in uniform looked out. A few of the soldiers laughed at their scout garb, but most of them only smiled gravely, and as if they were well pleased. The two scouts made for the nearest compartment, and found, when they were in it, that it was a first-class carriage, already containing two young officers who were smoking and chatting together. Hello, youngins, said one of the officers. Off to the war? They both laughed, which Harry rather resented. We're under orders, sir, he said politely. But of course, they won't let us scouts go to the war. Don't rag em, Cecil, said the other officer. They're just the sort of thing we need. Going to Ealing, boys? Harry checked 
Dick's impulsive answer with a quick snatch at his elbow. He looked his questioner straight in the eye. We weren't told to answer any questions, sir, he said. Both the officers roared with laughter, but they sobered quickly, and the one who had asked the question flushed a little. I beg your pardon, my boy, he said. The question is withdrawn. You're perfectly right, and you're setting us an example by taking things seriously. This war isn't going to be a lark. But you can tell me a few things. Your scouts, I see. I was myself once, before I went to Sandhurst. What troop and patrol? Dick told him, and the officer nodded. Good work. The scouts are going to turn out and help, hey? That's splendid. There'll be work enough to go all around, never you fear. If by any chance you should be going to Ealing Barracks, said the first officer rather shyly, and we should get off the train when you do, there's no reason why you shouldn't let us drive you out, is there? We're going there, and I don't mind telling you that we've just finished a two-hour leave to go and say goodbye to... to... His voice broke a little at that. In spite of his light-hearted manner and his rather chaffing tone, he couldn't help remembering that goodbye. He was going to face whatever fate might come. But the thoughts of those he might not see again could not be prevented from obtruding themselves. Shut up, Cecil, said the other. We've said goodbye, and that's the end of it. We've got other things to think of now. Here we are. The train pulled into Ealing Station. Here the evidences of war and warlike preparations were everywhere. The platforms were full of soldiers, laughing, jostling one another, saluting the officers who passed among them. And Harry, as he and Dick followed the officers toward the gate, saw one curious thing. A sentry stood by the railway official who was taking up tickets, and two or three times he stopped and questioned civilian passengers. Two of these, moreover, he ordered into the ticket office, where, as he went by, Harry saw an officer seated at the desk, examining civilians. Ealing, as a place where many troops were quartered, was plainly very much under martial law. And outside the station it was even more military. Soldiers were all about and automobiles were racing around, too. And there were many women and children there to bid farewell to the soldiers who were going. Where? No one knew. That was the mystery of the morning. Everyone understood that the troops were off, that they had their orders, but not even the officers themselves knew where it seemed. Here we are. Here's a car, said the officer called Cecil. Jump aboard, youngins. We know where you're going right enough. Might as well save some time and so in a few minutes they reached the great barracks. Here the bustle that had been so marked about the station was absent. All was quiet. They were challenged by a sentry, and Harry asked for the officer of the guard. When he handed him Wharton's letter, they were told to wait outside, and then in a few minutes the officer returned, passed them through, and turned them over to an orderly where Colonel Throckmorton, who was seemingly in charge of important affairs, received him. He returned their salute, then bent a rather stern gaze upon them before he spoke. End of chapter 3, part 2 Recording by Kangaroo